Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Dry Bulk panel of the Capital Link London Conference. My name is Bobby Mitropoulos, and I'm Managing Director of Weber Seas Hellas SA, a leading sea broking firm in Greece. Before we start, I would like to congratulate Capital Link for the excellent job they have done organizing this conference today. We have a great panel with us, which I'm sure will help us cover to cover several current and important topics during the short time we have. Our distinguished panelists today are Ms. Brigitte Vardal, CEO of Golden Ocean, Mr. Martin Wade, CEO of Green Road Shipping PTE, Mr. Stamatis Chantanis, CEO of Synergy, Synergy Maritime, and last but not least, Mr. Herman Bilum, Senior Vice President of Star Bar Carriers. Before we ask our panelists the first question, I would like to make a few uh, brief comments about the market. Despite the uh, continuous volatility in the dry bulk market, the fundamentals look positive and there is confidence in the market. It has been a slow recovery since the beginning of 2016 when the BDI hit an all-time low of 290 points. Since then, we have seen the BDI trend upwards, always with volatility, reaching 1,774 points, which was at the peak in, July to, in, uh, in the peak in July 2018. Just to give an idea what this means in time charter earnings, the BCI 5TC from slightly less than 2,000 a day in early 2016, rose to its peak at around 30,000 per day in December 2017, and trades currently around 16,000 per day. For uh, 2018, the Panamax rates average excess 11,000 per day, while the Supramax is averaged between 11 and 12,000 per day. We should know that the supply side fundamentals of the Supramax fleet are definitely improving, taking into consideration the fact that the order book is about 5.5%. The handy size rates average about 8,500 per day, and the limited fleet growth of the SECO is definitely a plus, I think. Despite the fact that the BDI has risen significantly since the beginning of 2016, we still believe the trend remains upward for the short and medium term. New building deliveries are down by approximately 40% year on year, which brings the fleet growth to about 2% for 18 and 19. The order book from over 20% back, back in 2015 has dropped down to 10% and remains close to 15-year lows. At least so far, we see some discipline in the new orders and no large speculative ordering, which always leads a very positive for the market. For the market. Even though Due to the improved freight market, the recycling of dry bulk vessels is almost non-existent. It is noticeable that about 7% of the fleet is 20 years or older. The Chinese GDP growth is estimated between 65 and 7% range, most likely closer to 65 uh, which is still very strong. <clears throat> The supply-demand balance seems to be proved now. Still, demand has been increased, and the same applies for coal demand for India and Southeast Asian countries. Iron ore imports to China are expected to rise this year between 3 and 3.5%. ,3 Obviously, the question of new regulations, such as ballast water treatment systems, bunker sulfur content, scrubbers, and tariffs between US and China remain of paramount importance. We have to see how this will affect the market over the coming years, and we'll discuss this with our panelists. At this point, I would like to ask our panelists our first question, start with Brigitte. How do you see the market progressing over the next one and a half to two years? And what is your general view across all segments? I think uh, we have seen, uh, as you commented on, uh, improving trends since 2016. And uh, it's actually been quite good improvements. Uh, we expect that to continue, gradual improvements, uh, but uh, we are probably this year on the capes around 18 and a half, uh, next year is 21. So it, it, it continues on the trend we have seen uh, from the past. 
Uh, and then there are some potential upsides that I think we will cover later on later. Uh, in terms of the market dynamics. Martin? I'm confident. Um, low order book, which can't change. With all the new regulations coming out, it stops owners from ordering, adopting a wait and see attitude. Nothing wrong with seaborne demand, 3 4%. China import substitution, Indian coal. Um, and history dictates when you have a low order book and steady seaborne trade growth, we stand a chance. And with IMO, the game changer 2020, potentially. Stamati, you share the same view? Huh? Yeah, well. Um, I agree with you 100%. I think that uh, the market currently has the best uh, fundamentals of the last uh, 15 or 17 years, especially as far as the supply of ships is concerned. Uh, I also agree that demand is there and we will continue to see a rising trend uh, in demand. And uh, given the fact that supply will possibly remain at these levels, then uh, I don't see anything but a very healthy market for the next few years. Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we are already at levels uh, talking about utilization. The market is balanced. Uh, we will still see a lot of volatility, and particularly on the capes. Um, but given that we are at, say, 86% uh, utilization, and we have synchronized growth in the world, it, it looks absolutely healthy. Um, but uh, the most important thing is still that uh, owners remain disciplined and... Uh, don't get tempted to order new capacity because we have seen that in the past, but that is kind of the most positive thing. The first email you read in the morning where there are no new orders placed, that's the most, the nicest email you read. So, right. so it looks, that's from, it, it looks healthy. Thank you. Uh, IMO 2020, uh, we discussed this in the previous topics, of course, in the previous panels, of course, but um, how do you see the market affected by uh, the new IMO 2020 requirements? What's the best strategy to approach uh, the market in this cycle, taking into consideration the above, the, uh, the above requirement? One way to meet the requirements is to install scrubbers, but I would prefer to address this in my next question, since for many owners, this is definitely not the solution. I don't know, Herman, you uh, I mean. These new regulations will be beneficial for everybody, uh, whether you install scrubbers or not. Um, and um, uh, it's uh, it's obviously to 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 make a proper judgment on the, or a forecast on the spread is uh, it's a political commodity. Difficult to say where the oil prices will be heading. It seems that consensus in general. It's for a higher oil prices, and uh, and the spread could absolutely go out. It will be beneficial for those who are installing scrubbers. Uh, but as I said, uh, it, for those who are not installing scrubbers, uh, you, you could see slower steaming, which will improve utilization. We'll talk about this as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, I think it will be helpful for everybody, whether you have a scrubber or not. I think um, bunker management will become more important and more complicated than what it is today. Uh, there will be various types of fuel, uh, the availability in various ports, the cleaning and the changing between fuels. And all this should also take some efficiency out of the fleet. Uh, so it should be, in addition to the slow steaming, something that would support uh, the market balance going forward. Well, um, I don't want to spoil the scrubber installation party, and uh, we as a company, we are actually installing scrubbers on our ships, but um, over the weekend I read the Goldman Sachs report. As we all know, there's about 2.4 million barrels of, uh, million bars a day of uh, fuel oil required by the marine industry, and about 1 million barrels of fuel oil can potentially be diverted low sulfur fuel oil can potentially be diverted from the onshore and the power plants into the marine industry. So that can potentially solve about 40% of the fuel requirements of the marine industry just by diverting the onshore to the marine industry by itself. Also in the United States, you have um, the cokers that all these refineries installed a few years ago prior to the sale oil boom. And all these cokers are now um, at 50% utilization. So, you know, if that 
becomes fully utilized, then you have a big amount of desulfurization at the source without reaching the new blends and all that. So, like I said, I mean, we are fully behind the scrubber installation, we're going to do it, but in our opinion, I don't think that the spread and the compliant fuels and all these things that people are anticipating for 2020 will be as such in order to pay back the investment like four months or six months. It's going to be a more evenly spread um, return on investment. I was uh, going to ask about the scrappers because, as you know, many owners in the beginning were very reluctant to uh, even discuss a possible scenario to install the uh, scrappers from their ships. Now we see more and more companies having taken the decision to install the uh, scrappers in their ships uh, as part of their fleet uh, in both new buildings and uh, second-hand vessels. According to Claxon's uh, research, we have about uh, 1,262 vessels, which is 3.9% of the existing fleet in tonnage terms and 27.3% of the new building order for all type of vessels. Uh, several dry bulk public companies have announced the intention to install scrubbers in their fleet, such as uh, Starbulk and Eagle Bulk and lately Safe Bulkers. Uh, what's your view on this? Do you think that more owners will uh, follow the option or perhaps it makes more sense environmentally, uh, financially or even operationally to find an alternative and if there is any besides? Uh, we, we, we're not, well, I'm opinion, apart from pumping it into the sea, let, let's move on. We have, a, we have handers and, and super ultras trading all over the world. There are 800 bunker ports in the world, which 350 are commercially viable. Some, a lot of them with only one tank. I think if you're going to go scrubbers, maybe on the big ships where you're trading A to B, on the smaller ships, where are we going to get bunkers from? I think it has to be long term, we have to be burning low sulfur or MGO, a cleaner uh, source of fuel, and slow steaming. I think Martin Stockford summed it up. We, we've reduced a lot of the CO2 already by slow steaming. So I can see where scrubbers come from as a short term fix, but long term, I think the industry has to clean up and buy a, a burn a better quality of fuel. Herman, since uh, you were one of the first who announced the... Um... Are we, I mean, we are, we are all in on scrubbers. Um, and uh, we started to, even though we have just recently announced it, we started to work on this uh, two and a half year ago. So we are I installing it on all the 111, 217 vessels by the 1st of January 2020. Uh, we hope to make the most benefit out of it by do most voyage charters rather than time charter. We don't want to share the benefit with our customers. Uh, and uh, we have already financing in place and uh, lined up with the arts and everything. And, and we are great believers in, in, the, in the scrubbers. Uh, and, and if you are right, uh, on on the spread, that is fine because then I would say uh, those who are trying to lobby for uh, postponements, they lose a lot of their arguments, and there have lot, been a lot of, lot of uh, owners uh, in denial when it comes to scrubbers and start to complain a few months prior implementation, which is a little bit too late, I'm afraid. So it's, it's uh, uh, but I think you will see more scrubbers, uh, but uh, but if you are going to uh, have uh, scrubbers uh, from decent manufacturers. Uh, there is, uh, you can't get that today, I think, prior 1st of January 2020 in, in a large scale. Well, if I may say, Bobby, that um, great news about scrubbers is that you will have all these ships stopping to install them. <laughs> Especially in the Cape sizes, you have a very tightly supplied market. And if, assuming there's going to be around three to 400 ships stopping in order to install the scrubbers, you know, that's going to create a huge supply deficit of tonnage, which is absolutely great for us, regardless of the question whether scrubbers are good or bad or whatever. I mean, that by itself is a huge argument yes, of course. for the supply. Brigitte. Yeah. Uh, we have decided to go for uh, half the capes sort of before or around the start of 2020, but you always have the options to add on. We, you will not be ready by the date, but of yes. course you always have the option to extend. 
In addition, I think it's important to look at the fuel efficiency of the fleet itself. Uh, because uh, this is all about the cost, uh, which is increasing, and the more fuel you burn, uh, of course, the higher higher the cost. So, uh, for a modern vessel, there is still a, a spread, but, but the difference is less than for older vessels. And in the long run, for those older vessels not installing scrubbers, I think it will be very hard to compete in the market as well. So that's another element which should be positive uh, on the supply side fundamentals. Right. But then when you talk about the number of vessels in total that install scrubbers, I think there are pockets like the capes, like the Vs, the, Vs, yes. the, the larger sizes which burn more fuel. So in those markets it will actually be a, a larger part of, of the market. And, and the reason why we have not done it on the smaller sizes mm. is, is the argument you talk about on, on the supply as well of the fuel. But the more owners, this sort of hype the more that people talk about it, the more people do, the less of an issue it will be in the end. Right. So. Another piece of uh, legislation is the requirement for the uh, ballast water treatment systems. What effect do you think it will have on older vessels uh, and eventually on the market? Uh, do you think owners will send the vessels for recycling, knowing the dry market remains fairly good and gives some healthy returns to the owners? Martin? It's interesting. We, we obviously planned this, but looking at our 14, 15-year-old ships, you're right, third special survey, what it's going to cost, IMO 2020, it's, it's a huge headache. And I think uh, if you push ships to 20 years, I think that there's probably no option for these ships to continue trading. So we, we believe more regulation, the better, and, and the sooner it's enforced. But again, two, two game changers coming up. So, uh, and it takes, as you say, it takes ships out of service and keeps them away from the market. Herman, any uh, ideas? I think it's, um, it is supportive to, uh, to scrapping. But uh, right now, I mean, consensus. People are optimists. So uh, as you started by your introduction, you, there is basically no scrapping taking place right now because people are optimistic. But, but at one point of time, when you are going to take the vessel through a special survey, Renew steel renewals, and on top of that, uh, uh, cope for new regulation. It, it will be an expensive exercise, mm -hmm. and I, I, fu I fully agree with Martin. It's um, we welcome all the regulations. Just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, cape size. What's your uh, view on the cape size vessels? Uh, we're experiencing considerable uh, volatility, and uh, at the same time, from 100 vessels. Uh, previously ordered per year, we're down to uh, 2025 for 2020 and 2021. Hopefully this means Cape size, Cape size orders will uh, stay close to the uh, all-time low and, uh, there's n and there's no slowdown in uh, Chinese demand. Do you see the Cape market at uh, its peak in 2019 or even 2020? And what's the uh, risk in the future for the existing bigger size vessels? Uh, for example, can the Valimax new and existing tonnage can affect the Cape market? And if yes, to what degree, in your opinion, if, and if there are also any other risks that can affect the uh, Cape size market? Stamati, would you like to take this one? Well, sure, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, instead of spending time discussing about the IMO and the water balance treatment system, I think we should um, again reiterate <coughs> how strong the fundamentals of the market uh, are. Um, especially on the Cape sizes, I think that uh, we have the strongest fundamental um, market of the last uh, 20 years. Um, demand continues to increase by 3 to 4 percent a year, and when we're talking about 1.4 billion tons of iron ore, Obviously, 4% increase is a huge amount of additional cargo into the water. Um, what people tend to forget is that there's a diversion of cargo, more and more cargo from Brazil, which is a longer distance. So the ton mile effect is actually much bigger as compared to the actual increase of the trade. And that's also very important. And regarding the Valamax is that, um, you know, thankfully, um, they appear to be a big barrier for people to consider new orders. Um, I was at Vale's offices again for the third time this year last week. Um, vale has ordered 47 ships. Um, obviously, 
that's not more than 20% of actual valleys um, transportation. And uh, we don't anticipate um, those ships by themselves to be any risk to the market. Uh, also, don't forget that there are about 55 to 60 converted VLOCs that were built in the 90s. And the Valemaxes are merely there to replace those ships that need to be scrapped. So, in my opinion, the Valemax is a zero-sum game and not even enough to cover the incremental um, supply of iron ore coming out of Brazil. The rest of the market, we all know, it's fantastic fundamentals and we hope those to continue uh, by not placing new building orders uh, of new cape sizes. Brigitte. Well, I think um, I agree on the uh, sort of the average over the year. I think what they potentially can do is add some volatility uh, to the spot uh, cape market. Uh, both on both sides, uh, since, since it's kind of the base load, part of the base load is taken. But I agree there are older vessels that will go out and the volumes are increasing. Um, another element which we are monitoring carefully is the use of scrap steel, which is on the rise in China. Yes. Uh, but uh, it seems that at least at the moment it's balanced with the increase in, in imports and, and the reduction of the domestic trade, which is... Uh, statistics are a bit difficult uh, it's, uh, to explain, but it's down 40% yes. uh, year-to-date on the domestic production. But then, uh, the bigger vessels, there are new trades coming on as well. Boxit from Guinea is a new trade, which has not been there. And if you look over the time, the evolution is to growing and, and transporting larger lot sizes. So that should be positive for the capes overall. Yeah. Uh, if you think a little bit shorter term, if, if Vale is going to be close to their target for 2018, 390 million tons, we are up for a, uh, really a uh, bull market over the next couple of months on for the capes, if, if, if that is going to materialize. And, uh, so it's, uh, they are far behind uh, their target, and so they really have to ramp up. Uh, we saw... One of the reasons and which underline what Birgitte just said is uh, it's that the volumes are both for good and for bad. So we, one of the reasons that September, the first part of September was slow was the number of volumes uh, arriving at the Brazilian ports. But right now there seems to be a certain clear out. And if that coincides with this uptick in exports, I think you could see uh, Cape size rates spot go anywhere in October, November. Martin, I don't know if you have... Just, it was what Birgitta picked up on the, the scrap. If you, the fig, some of the figures being suggested by 2020, China could be producing 200 million tonnes a year of domestic scrap. And that ultimately cannot be good for the, for the cake business. Although, of course, the import substitution with higher quality is good. Yes. We can export it on your ships. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, on the new building, so far we have uh, seen less speculative orders from uh, leasing houses, which obviously is a positive. Are you of the opinion this will continue in the short and medium term? Brigitte? It's, uh, I would like you to see to be fueled by owners wanting to order and then the leasing houses to finance it rather than the leasing houses to fuel the ordering yes. and then find a customer. I think that would be a better approach. But uh, um, it's not as bad as private equity was back in the days, but it's one of the new sources of capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think what is also for maybe more important is that it seems that the <coughs> PE money is out of new building. Uh, that's rather maybe more helpful than the financing itself. It's uh, a lot of people burn their fingers and and, uh, and the appetite uh, from that source seems to be limited. Well, there's also another point that um, on the actual economics of the new buildings, there's a huge price differential between the new buildings and the equivalent of five-year-old ship. So, for example, in the Cape sizes, the new buildings like what, around $50 million as a new building contract. And Actually, the now it's more in Japan. Yes, yes. And the five-year-old ship is, let's say, 32, 33 million. So in order to capture that differential, yeah. you know, you need many, many years of a good market for that to come up. So we don't really see the new building prices coming off. 
but assuming that the second hand prices start to rise, that means that the NAVs of <laughs> you know, the companies presenting here today may double or triple if that converges into the new building market. I'm just curious, in building new buildings, and all new buildings come with HFO engines. So again, it's what are we ordering going forward, realistically? Right. Let, let me tell you something. I was, um, yeah. I was at uh, Valle last week, and um, you know they're taking delivery of these Valle Maxes that apparently were LNG ready and uh, scrubber fitted, but not scrubber installed. So they need to go back to the yard and install the scrubbers. So brand new ships that they got delivered even this year, they need to go back to China and retrofit the Valle Maxes to, to install the scrubbers. So, you can imagine that. Yeah. A different topic is the uh, consolidations and uh, new IPOs. Are we going to see any consolidations in uh, the foreseeable uh, future? And what's your view on the IPOs? Uh, are the market conditions, first of all, uh, favorable to absorb new IPOs? And we have seen a couple of attempts uh, lately. They didn't go through. They were not successful, of course. And uh, if traditional bank finance uh, is available, and if there is any alternative uh, finance uh, today for the owners. Brigitte? I think uh, banks are available for some customers, but not for everyone. For and traditional finance. Traditional bank financing is available, yes. and, and that should support uh, larger units and consolidation over time. Uh, but f the consolidation <coughs> is mainly an advantage for investors that got more liquidity in the share. Uh, but on dry bulk, if you have a decent size, it doesn't help that much uh, on yes. the cost. Uh, and on the commercial side, like uh, Austin Starbuck, which has uh, sizable fleets from a, from a listed perspective, we are still a small uh, player in, in the total dry bulk markets. It's, it's a fragmented market uh, as such. Uh, we look at consolidation opportunities. They should be uh, valuable and accretive for existing investors. Uh, we always look at opportunities, but we are also happy with the fleet and we don't have to grow uh, as it is today. And you, do you think the markets will be receptive today to do something like that? Uh. I think it is more receptive for existing companies uh, than for new companies. Yes. And actually, I think uh, the investors would like to see fewer and larger entities to invest in right. rather than several new players. Right. Mm. Uh, Herman, what's your uh, view on this? I mean, I, it would be difficult for me to say that we don't believe in consolidation, given that we have been through three of the last few months. Um, uh, and we've grown the fleet from around 70 vessels to 111 uh, on an all-delivered basis. Uh, or, uh, but on the IPOs, then why should you buy something at NAV when you can buy others with a discount, with liquidity? I mean, I think it's... Uh, it, it, it will be difficult, and I think it's all about liquidity, really, in, in, the, in, the, in the stock, and whether you are, and, and I fully agree that a, a size, you, 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 you don't necessarily consolidate to achieve buying power, but uh, rather to, uh, to have shareholders being able to get in and out that with decent volumes. And uh, um, so it's, uh, but I think it will be an appeal, uh, fight for new IPOs, at least within dry bulk. Uh, and it's been proven over the last year or so. It's been not that easy. Well, uh, the IPO market is obviously very difficult, if not uh, impossible, for a number of um, dry bulk companies. Um, what we realized recently, and uh, we always tend to forget, is that uh, a lot of investors have um, burn their fingers by investing into the dry bulk. The last five years, there's been $5.8 billion of losses sustained from all the dry bulk public companies in the United States. <coughs> Synergy MSA is the only company, and maybe Golden Ocean, that did not have on a cumulative basis losses over the last five years. But if you look at the numbers, you know, and suddenly you have uh, listed companies that have lost anywhere between 600 million and 1.7 billion 
um, over the last five years that you know can potentially uh, deter investors um, from investing um, into the space. However, I think that um, with improved markets, it's all about NAV and it's all about cash flow. Once we're able to uh, prove that the numbers make sense and people can actually make money, we will start by attracting um, the momentum players and possibly the long-term players into the space again. And we are actually looking forward to that, uh, regardless of liquidity, size, and all that. There's, there's a market for, uh, for everyone. Market but obviously, we, 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 we listed. We, we did deliberately, uh, we didn't need to raise equity, so we took the decision to list. I now spend a lot of time in New York, and as Dematis says, yes, investors are wary of shipping, non-trustworthy. So how that trust comes back, I think it has to change to a degree. Transparency, the affiliated party transactions have to go, but it's going to be a hard slog. And the investors we see, they like the story, NAV, great, but there are easier ways for them to invest, and with the trade war going on at the moment. So it's going to be a hard slog. And as I say, potentially consolidation will be the way to go. But I think for a lot of people, as we've seen with the two recent ones, both for different reasons, it's now on impossible at the moment, I think, to, to get the market off the ground. All right. So thank you so much. Thank you.